Now, the Victorian Council of Social Service analysis of census data from 2021 has revealed 800,000 Victorians are living in poverty. A breakdown shows that women make up 55% of adults experiencing this kind of hardship, with tens of thousands of children also doing it tough. VCOS CEO Emma King says there are people in every corner of the state struggling financially. She joins us now. Emma King, good afternoon. These are very uh, stark statistics and they're a couple of years old now. So what do we know about how these may have progressed? Oh, good afternoon, Prue, and thanks for having me on. They are stark statistics. Uh and what we do know, because we've done two iterations of this, so we take the census data. So we've done census data from 2016, and we had that report come out, obviously, some time ago. And we've now got this new report that um, is based on the census data from 2021. So we're looking at you know really extreme rates of poverty. But some of the things that we also know have happened since 2021 is we've seen you know really significant interest rate rises, a huge number of them, really significant increases in the cost of energy and the cost of food and the cost of fuel. So when you look at what that impact has, um, since these results were, were released, you would imagine that if that census data was to be taken today, the picture unfortunately would be even worse. So you think that it would be there would be more people in poverty or they'd be just living on a lot less? I think there'd be more people in poverty and more people living on a lot less. I think it would be both. Um, you know, when we look at uh, the the data from here, so, for example, when we look at poverty in regional and rural areas, it's really, it's widespread. Over 80% of the communities, and anyone can jump onto our website and have a look at, at the interactive maps, because what they show is um, the, the story of poverty in Victoria. So they highlight demographic groups who are most affected, where they live, and you know, and how that um, might have changed over time as well. But we know 80% of what we call SA2s outside of Melbourne have got poverty rates of over 10%. So that's really um, very significant. And we also know that poverty deepens significantly for people who are aged 65 and over and for people who are living on their own. So no crossover there, but that's quite significant. What does it actually mean to be living on or below the poverty line? Well, it's about um, half the median income before you take into account the cost of housing. So generally, if you're a single person, it's about $489 a week. If you're a couple with two children, uh, $1,027 a week. Uh, we know as well, when we couple this with other reports that have come out, like the Anglicare report into looking at, well, if you were looking for a rental and you're living on job seeker, where would you be able to afford to buy, We'd, sorry, to rent? And we know there's pretty much nowhere um so you know when you put all of that together if you think you're trying to get by on 489 dollars a week basically good luck with finding a rental and one of the other things that came up through the report this time as well is we found more people who've got a job um as well are living in poverty so a job isn't the, the sort of the um, the, the freeing up that it once was. So it's not only people who are on welfare support payments. A number of people who've got a job are also represented in poverty figures. And again, a number of people who've got a mortgage uh, as well as renters are also represented really significantly in these figures. And you, you put all of that together and it is, a, it is a perfect storm. Is that because wages just aren't rising in line with inflation and, and all of the other cost of living rises that we're putting up with? That certainly the lack of increase in wages has contributed to that. I think there's also a number of other things that contribute to that from an economic point of view. When we look at jobs, we've seen a real increase in precarious work. So people might get some hours each week. They don't know how many hours they're going to get from week to week and they don't have that stability of income. We've also seen a huge rise in the number of people who are in lower paid feminised workforces. So when we look at the care industries overall, and we saw this during COVID in aged care, for example, that people who are often on lower wages, they might have to hold a number of jobs in order to try and make ends meet, but they don't always know how many hours they're going to get each week. Uh, we're seeing what was traditionally kind of manufacturing jobs that were full-time, regular wages, enough to, to pay the bills when we go back years. Those jobs have often been replaced by, you know, retail 
care sector jobs that just don't earn the same kinds of income as well. So I think that goes some way way to explaining it. One of the other things we've seen, though, also in it's, it's this interesting thing because the the census this time obviously picked up the pandemic, and so we've seen some almost distortions of some of the data where it almost looks in some areas like poverty has decreased. But when we need to dig into that data, you can see that really where that's happened, it's where their popular tree change or sea change areas where we know Melbournians flocked during the pandemic and perhaps bought properties there because they can now work remotely. And that's had this flow on impact of people who lived in those communities beforehand, not being able to afford to live there anymore um, and often being pushed further out of town as well. So it actually has quite a rich, a rich focus to it. What are you asking for? I mean, what can be done? Yep, that's exactly right. So in the pandemic, we saw one of the solutions, which was with the stroke of the pen, poverty was pretty much eradicated overnight. So you remember those queues around Centrelink and people said, I can't survive on that amount of money. Yep. And Job Seeker was doubled overnight. So we need a permanent, real increase in benefits because it makes a significant difference. It means that people are actually able to afford enough to even look for a job and they can put food on the table and they can pay the bills. We know there's significant action that can be taken on housing affordability. We need to increase um, supply of social housing by 6,000 new homes for the next 10 years. We need to look at things like regulating short-term letting, um, mandatory inclusion rezoning, um, and the other things that make a really big difference in terms of the provision of uh, housing. Um, we know we can address some of the cost of living pressures. We've been advocating for a cost of living commissioner that would really look to address challenges across multiple areas of government, like concessions, food security, etc. So they're all very um, big things, Emma King. I mean, they're not they're yeah. not the sort of thing that you will necessarily get straight away. I know that there's a, a lot of work being done in that short term rental accommodation space. It's I mean, as you say, it's not very well regulated. What I'm really keen to to hear just before I let you go, I know I've, I've had yeah. a lot of your time, but what would you like to see there? I mean, there are people who do have the sort of Airbnb model and they are worried about what might happen to their side business um, if regulation is too um, uh, too onerous or, or or, uh, or too much? Look, I guess there's a part in there in terms of looking at how do we separate. So I'm not suggesting for a moment everyone that owns an Airbnb is a terrible person or anything like that, but there's this interesting part about how do we make sure that everyone who needs a safe place to live, um, that they can afford to live in, can get one, and how do we balance this against an investment market mm. because homes are homes. So I think that we, we do need a rethink around that. Some of the um, thinking is federal, some is state, some is local government. You know, do we want to prioritise Airbnbs, short-term rentals, or do we want to prioritise actually saying, as a community, we really value most strongly that everyone has somewhere safe and secure to live, 